Thank you for the Chris and good morning my dearly beloved brethren and sisters and our Lord Jesus Christ. Margaret and I bring with us the loving and fraternal greetings of your brethren and sisters who meet at the Morton Bay Ecclesia, uh, which is to the north of, of Brisbane, but it's one of a dozen or more ecclesias uh, in the city. And brothers and sisters, we've come now to the culmination of our consideration of Gibeah of Saul and the quarrel of Yahweh's covenant in that place. It is very fitting, is it not, that we should conclude our studies with the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ on this matter. We are here to remember him today, to see, brothers and sisters, what was going on in his mind as he made his way to the cross. And we're going to see that his mind was actually on the matter of Gibeah. Yes, it was. His mind was on the matter of Gibeah. And I'll demonstrate that to you this morning. Now, I don't think there's any doubters left in the room. There may be. But if there is, we're going to do a very short exercise at the beginning of our exhortation today. That exercise will be to demonstrate that when you think Gibeah, you think covenants, vows, oaths, and promises. True? Yes, it is true. But for those who might still doubt, I'm going to take you to three passages in the Old Testament where the word Geba, which of course is the basis of the name Gibeah, it is the root Hebrew word. We want to have a look at where this word Gibeah occurs. The first two times in the Old Testament where it occurs, and then another very significant one in the book of Psalms. So would you please come back with me to Genesis chapter 49, to the very first occurrence of the Hebrew word Giba or Gibeah. It is, of course, to be found in the last words of Jacob, Jacob's prophecy of the last days when he blesses his sons. And when he comes to Joseph, the most extensive type of our Lord Jesus Christ in the word of God, he speaks of him eloquently in the language of verse 25 and 26. He says in verse 25, Even by the God of thy Father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, blessings of thy Father, he says in verse 26, have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors. It's, it's, it's inscrutable language, isn't it? But here comes the word Giba or Gibeah. Because he goes on to say in verse 26. The blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. The word hills is our word Giba or Gibeah. It's the first occurrence, brothers and sisters, of 69 occurrences of this word in the Old Testament. The everlasting hills. So here we have Gibeah. So what would you think would be identified with Gibeah? Well, let's just read on. Because it then says this. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. And that word separate is the first occurrence in the Old Testament of the word Natsur, which of course is normally rendered Nazarite. So Joseph was the first known Nazarite unto God. So what do Nazarites do? Well, Nazarites make vows, don't they? Yes. Think Gibeah, think covenants, vows, oaths, and promises. Come to Exodus chapter 17. He was the second time that the word Gibeah or Giba is used in the Old Testament, and it's used twice in the record of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17 sees Israel come, of course, to a place where there was no water. They came to Rephidim. But there, in fact, was water. It was just subterranean water. Because there were, there were trees there indicating that there was water. Brothers and sisters, 
this place was to become very significant in relation to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. For bursting out of this record for the first time as a man called Joshua, and for the first time, except for the casual reference in Genesis 14, and the origins of Amalek, this is the first time that Amalek as a people appear on the scene. So you have Yahshua opposed to Amalek, and Amalek becomes, in this chapter, the type of the serpent in political manifestation. And here in this record, we have the drama of Moses striking the rock at Rephidim, the Zer, with the serpent rod, which speaks, of course, of the crucifixion of Christ. And from that rock flows living water. And the Amalekites turn up to take it. And Joshua is commissioned with the task of removing that problem. We know the story well. Let's pick the record up in verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, first time you read of him in the Bible. We believe he was released from the turquoise mines at Dothkar when Israel arrived there. And here we read that Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men. And the word men there, brothers and sisters, is Enosh. It means weak, mortal men. Nobody's come to this hall this morning thinking that they're an ish. We've come to be in the company of Yahshua. We're all weak, mortal men. Choose us out, weak, mortal men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. That word hill is the word Gibeah, Gibeah. And it's used again in the following verse. In verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill, the top of the Geba, the Gibeah. So what is this chapter about? Well, the drama is, is, is obvious, isn't it? You have Amalek who's come to steal the precious water that has come from the striking of the rock with the serpent rod, speaking of the crucifixion of Christ. And you have Moses going up with Aaron and Hur, Hur the prince of the tribe of Judah, and Moses the high priest elect. And he was to be there on that hill, the Geba, while Joshua fought with the weak mortal men of Israel against Amalek. And we know what happens. Moses holds up the rod in his hand and he tires. He probably swaps hands and he holds up the rod and he tires. And in the end, brothers and sisters, he has to have two hands on the rod, seated on what's called an Eben, the building stone of the Ecclesia. And beside him he has the prince of Judah and the high priest elect, he being the great prophet. And there was the vision of the joy set before Yahshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was fighting down on that plain. And here you have a man with his hands on a pole. A crucified man, so to speak. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Joshua discomforted Amalek that day. So what does Moses do? Well, he recounts all of this. In verse 14 it says, And Yahweh said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. He didn't need it rehearsed. This wasn't for the Joshua who fought the Amalekites, brothers and sisters. This was for the Joshua who went into the synagogue in Nazareth regularly and opened up the scrolls. This was for our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why I can say that with absolute confidence? Because of what follows. Read verse 15. Maybe the end of verse 14. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nisai. Now that word Nisai is the Hebrew word Nes. N-E-C. You know where it next occurs in your Bible? This is the first occurrence of that word. The next occurrence of the word Ness, used twice, is in Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, where Moses and Aaron made a brazen serpent and put it on a rod, a Ness, a pole. And it was raised up before Israel. And our Lord Jesus Christ in John 3.14 said, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, 
so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The next time you read Ness, it's in the context of the crucifixion of Christ. As is this way. And then you read this in verse 16. For he said, because Yahweh has sworn that, he, that Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That's, as you well know, that's Genesis 3.15, isn't it? The first great covenant. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. So Yahweh will have war with Amalek the type of the serpent in political manifestation from generation to generation until he expunges them from the face of the earth. So you see why Gibeah is here, don't you? You see why Gibeah is here? This is about God's first great covenant, brothers and sisters. This whole story. It's about his first great covenant. That's why Gibeah is there. So a third one. Come to Psalm 65, please. beautiful psalm this is. Psalm of the Kingdom Age. We're firstly going to, uh, going to read verse 12 of Psalm 65. This is where the word Gibeah or Giba occurs. Verse 12. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills, the little Gibeahs, rejoice on every side. Strange language, brothers and sisters, it's actually talking about you and me. It's talking about the saints and their role in the kingdom. So why is Gibeah here? I mean, it's not used all that often, Gibeah. 69 in the whole Old Testament, not that often. Why here, do you think? Look at verses 1 and 2. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, and Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee all flesh shall come. Yeah. This is about the time when all men will make vows and keep them. Yeah, it's the time of Gibeah. When finally, brothers and sisters, covenants and vows will be kept. So you see, there's no doubt, is there? There is no doubt. Think Gibeah, think covenants, vows, oaths and promises. So, what about Gibeah in the Old Testament beyond? Well, yesterday, I think it was, we looked at Isaiah 10. It might have been earlier. We looked at Isaiah 10. We will find Gibeah mentioned in Isaiah 10, 29 as one of the stations of Gog and his advance into the land leading to Armageddon. But that's not what I want to have a look at. I want you to come to the book of Hosea. Let's have a look at Gibeah in the book of Hosea. Because this is where our Lord's mind was, brothers and sisters, on the way to the cross. We're going to start in the book of Hosea, chapter 5 and verse 8. Hosea 5, verse 8 says, Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah, cry aloud at beth or Bethel, after thee, O Benjamin. So there's the first of four occurrences of Gibeah in this book. Come to chapter 9 and verse 9. As the 9, 9 says, They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. Have a look at chapter 10 and verse 9. We read this a little while ago. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not reach them. They didn't learn the lessons as we saw in our first study. The so brothers and sisters four times in the book of Hosea, Gibeah is mentioned. That seems a bit over the top, doesn't it? Not really. What's the story of Hosea about? What's the book of Hosea about? 
Well, it's about the prophet being asked to model Yahweh himself. The prophet in chapter 1 of Hosea is told to find a wife of some dubious origin, a harlot, which is what Yahweh did when he took Israel out of Egypt. We're told that in Ezekiel 16 and 23. When Yahweh went to get a wife out of Egypt to marry her at Sinai, she was a harlot. So he asked Hosea to marry a harlot. A harlot who couldn't keep a covenant, just like Israel couldn't keep a covenant. And you know the story of what happened to Hosea's wife. She ran away from him. He had one child by her, and the next two are from two different fathers, and he's not one of them. So she has children to other men. So this is the story of the book of Hosea. It's about covenant breaking. So why wouldn't Gibeah be there four times? And the book of Hosea is all about covenants, isn't it? We'll just take you through a few of the passages. I want you to come to Hosea 2 and verse 18. Quite apart from the covenant of marriage made in chapter 1, which all prefigures, of course, the work of God with his people in the future. We read in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 18 these words. This is about the work of Elijah in the recovery of his people in the latter days. In verse 18 we read, And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, etc. Verse 19, I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And we are told back in verse 16 that Israel will no longer call him Ishai, that is my husband. Thou shalt call me Ishai rather, thou shalt no longer call me Balai. So Israel's going to change their view of their God. They call him Balai or my Lord. They're going to call him my husband. So we see this is all about covenants, and particularly here about a marriage covenant between Yahweh and his wife Israel. You know, it's one of those fascinating things, brothers and sisters, in the prophecy of Jeremiah. When the message of Elijah goes out, you know what that message says? He goes out to those Jews in the land of the north, the Jews outside the land where Elijah's work is to be done. And his message from Yahweh is this to a people who were taken into captivity in 722 BC. 2,730 years before. His message is, Return unto me, for I am married unto thee. So God's marriage covenant with Israel, which he made in Exodus chapter 19, 2,700 plus years ago, is still valid, brothers and sisters. He never remarried. He's only ever had one wife. And like the Lord Jesus Christ, he will only ever have one wife. The covenant wasn't broken. They broke it in the sense that they turned their back on him and, and like Hosea's wife, walked out of his house. But just like Hosea's wife, he's going to get her back. And that will be the work of Elijah and many sitting in this room. That's the story of Hosea. Come to chapter 6 and verse 7. Isaiah 6, 7 says, and you'll, you'll see just casting your eye back to verse 1 and 2, what the context is. Verse 1 says, Come and let us return unto Yahweh, for he hath torn. He will heal us. Look at verse 2. After two days will he revive us. Yes, after two millennial days. They went into captivity in 722 BC. And says in the third day he will raise us up. Yes, it will be during that third millennium after their dispersion that they will be restored to faithfulness as Yahweh's wife. Verse 7 says, But they like men, they like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Have a look at Hosea 8 and verse 1, just across the page. 
Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of Yahweh because they have transgressed thy covenant. Trespassed against my law. Have a look at chapter 10 and verse 4. They have spoken words swearing falsely in making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. And have a look at Hosea 12 and verse 1. Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. He daily increaseth lies and desolation. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians. And oil is carried into Egypt. Latter day Israel is going to make a covenant with the Assyrians, brothers and sisters. Russia, the latter day Assyrian. And there are many scriptures that actually demonstrate that very plainly. So you see the theme of Hosea? It's covenants. So why wouldn't Gibeah be there? Of course it's got to be there. And that's why the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ was in this context of Hosea as he made his way to the cross. Now I want you to do something if you can. I actually noticed there was a piece of paper on the, on the seat that I sat on. I'm going to use it. I'm going to put it in Hosea. And I'm going to go to Luke chapter 23. And the reason I want to put something in there is because we're going to make comparisons between the book of Hosea and Luke chapter 23. Pop something in Hosea. Come across to Luke 23. I'm going to start at the beginning of the chapter. Our Lord Jesus Christ is arraigned before Pilate. That's the message of verse 1. In verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. There's the introduction, brothers and sisters, to the greatest, greatest repudiation of covenant in human history. We're going to see that repudiation of God's covenant in John 19 and verse 15 in a moment. Alright, this is the beginning of it. That he was forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Well, I would have thought that a Jew would have thought that Messiah was a king, wouldn't you? That's what Christ is, Messiah. I would have thought Jews would have thought Messiah was king. And Pilate asked Jesus, saying in verse 3, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus says to him, you got that right. And that's what that means. When it says here, thou sayest it, it means in the vernacular, you got that one right. But the Jews didn't have it right. And Pilate was to write those words above the cross, wasn't he? He had it right. And he insisted on, on that statement remaining there. Pilate knew more about this than the Jews themselves, which is why he's reluctant to give them their wish. So there's the beginning of the story, brothers and sisters. But I want you to have a look and see what happens when you turn the page to verse 27 of Luke 23. And there followed him a great company of people and of women. So he's now been dismissed, he's been brutalized. He's been blindfolded and slapped on the face. He's had a crown of thorns crushed over his head, <coughs> being led away. And he's got to carry the tea piece of the cross, a reasonable sized piece of timber, by the way. And he's struggling with it. And there followed, followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed him and lamented him. Verse 28. Think about this, brothers and sisters. What would you be thinking about? What would you be thinking about if you were in his position? Well, he tells us what he's thinking about. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming into which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. All of, all of what he said in verse 28, brothers and sisters, and verse 29 comes from the book of Hosea. You know that? 
You certainly know that what he says in verse 30 comes from the book of Hosea because your margin tells you that. Verse 30, he goes on to say, Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. That's a direct quotation from Hosea 10 and verse 8. With one difference, of course, swapped around. It says in Hosea 10 verse 8, it makes the statement in that verse towards the end, they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills fall on us. The other way around. It's a clear quotation from Hosea 10 and verse 8. But then he says in verse 31 of Luke 23, For if they do these things in a green tree, what should be done in the dry? And that too is from the book of Hosea. Now I'm going to step you through this. I'm going to step you through where the Lord's mind is. So you'll need to do some flicking backwards and forwards just to check me out. Okay. So we're going to start, we're going to start with the matter of him being rejected as king first. You're going to have to have a third hand at work here. Right? So don't lose Luke 23. <coughs> but I want you to open to John chapter 19 as well if you can. You reckon you can do that? Now I'm not sure you can do this with gadgets, but anyway. See what you can do. So this is a similar record, but it adds something. <coughs> so in John chapter 19, we have, of course, Pilate, he scourges Jesus, sold a plant of a crown of thorns, put it on his head, put a purple robe on him. Verse 3, said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. And he goes out and he pleads with the people. Of course, he doesn't win. And we come down, brothers and sisters, to the awful record in verses 13 to 15 of John chapter 19. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat of the place that is called the pavement in the Hebrew Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And here comes the greatest, the ultimate repudiation of covenant in history. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now that of course excludes God, doesn't it? Leave alone rejecting Christ, Jesus of Nazareth as their king. Leave alone that. This is a repudiation of God, who was their king. Now where does that come from? Well, it originally comes from Judges chapter 17 to 21. There was no king in Israel. Every man did right in his own eyes. Yeah, that's where it originally comes from. But it's actually drawn, brothers and sisters, from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 3. Hosea 10 and verse 3 which says this for now shall they say we have no king there it is it was prophesied and you're going to see why our Lord's mind is back here because he knew all about this he knew that Hosea is based upon covenants he knew that Gibeah is here for a reason so his mind is in this record when he speaks in Luke 23 to the women we shall see that. But I mean, just a word about this repudiation of covenant. Vincent, in his word studies, makes this comment about John 19, verse 15. Under this phrase, we have no king but Caesar, he says, these words uttered by the chief priests are very significant. These chief representatives of the theocratic government of Israel thus formally and expressly renounce it and declare their allegiance to a temporal and pagan power. This utterance is the formal abdication of the messianic hope. 
You can't do any worse than that. You cannot do any worse than that. You see how important this was to our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters? Ringing in his ears is that cry. We have no king but Caesar. So where's his mind going to be? When he's going down the way to the cross to Golgotha, where's it going to be? Yeah, where it comes from. Now let me show you, it does come from me. Let's do some comparisons. You can drop John 19 now if you wish. All I want is Luke 23 and, and Hosea 9 and 10. Let's have a look. Have a look, brothers and sisters, at, at Luke chapter 20. Sorry, um, have a look at, um, at Luke chapter 23 with me when it says in verse 27, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. And Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Now that is drawn from Hosea chapter 9, verses 12 to 14. So come back to Hosea 9 and verse 12. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them, that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Give them, O Yahweh, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. That's why he says in verse 29 of Luke 23, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. You see where his mind is, brothers and sisters? You know, after he quotes... Hosea 10 verse 8 in verse 30 he says in verse 31 of Luke 23 for if they do these things in a green tree what should be done in the dry? So where does that come from? Well that comes from Hosea chapter 9 and verse 16 Hosea 9 16 says Ephraim is smitten their root is dried up they shall bear no fruit Yea, they shall bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Mm. That's where his mind is. Now he's wearing a crown of thorns, isn't he? He's got a crown of thorns on his head, brothers and sisters. Have a look at Hosea 10 and verse 8. Because Hosea 10 verse 8 is the verse he, quoted, he quotes, the latter portion of it. That they shall say to the mountains, cover us into the hills, fall on it. But look at the earlier words of verse 8 of Hosea 10. The high places also of Avon, meaning Bethel. The sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up upon their altars. He had thorns shut down his head. And you can go on and on like that, brothers and sisters. Because this is where the Lord's mind is on this occasion you know there's a future and he knew the future as well come to Hosea chapter 14 Hosea 14 verses 6 to 8 speak about the future of this people whose root is dried up who are barren we read in verse 6 of the 14th chapter. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him, and observed him, I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. The change is coming, brothers and sisters. Like Hosea, Yahweh is going to get his wife back. And when she comes back, 
she will be a covenant keeper. She will no longer have her children snatched away by the oppressor. It will no longer be a, a dry tree. It will be a green tree. If they do this in the green tree, he says, what will they do with the dry? And it got drier after his day. Because they had forsaken the covenant. Yahweh sent against them the oppressor. In the events of AD 66 to AD 70. Is there any doubt that our Lord Jesus Christ was thinking about the issues of Gibeah? On the way to the cross, as he endured that awful repudiation of covenant by his own people, no doubt at all. Brothers and sisters, we spent a few days together thinking about covenant. We are such a wonderfully privileged people to have a God who is faithful to covenant because we ourselves are not always like Israel, faithful to come. But he remains firm and faithful. I want to just bring before you a few passages that speak of his character. <coughs> you don't need necessarily to turn these up. Just listen carefully. In Daniel 9 verse 4 we read, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, Keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commands. In Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 32 we read. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty and the terrible God. Who keepest covenant and mercy. In Psalm 89 and verse 34 in the context of the covenant made to David. That the Jews repudiated in the presence of Pilate and their king. We read these words. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. But what about Israel? Well, their record of failure is spelled out too. In Ezekiel 16 verse 59, For thus saith Adonai Yahweh, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. In Ezekiel 17 verse 15, in the context of evil Zedekiah, we read, Shall he break the covenant and be delivered? And in Jeremiah 11 and verse 10, we read, The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. But it's all going to change, brothers and sisters, when Yahweh gets his wife back. And in Jeremiah 50 verse 5, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to Yahweh in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. That is where we should be today. We have made a covenant. It should be a perpetual covenant that is not forgotten. And in Ezekiel 20 verse 37 we read, And I will cause you to pass out of the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Saul lost his kingdom and eternal life <coughs> because he couldn't keep a covenant. What about us? I mentioned in one of our studies, brothers and sisters, that, that I have made at least two vows, two covenants. Baptism was the most important. But then I made a vow of marriage. Another covenant which can have an impact upon the first is not properly considered. And we know where we sit in the scheme of things. We're not yet married to the bridegroom that is about to come. We're a spouse to him. You know the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2? 
that I've espoused you unto Christ as a chaste virgin. Yes, you're aware of that. You know, we have a hymn in our hymn book, hymn 429, that reads this way, that is sung normally at weddings, usually only at weddings, because it reads like this. Maker of all things, we earnestly pray, please bless these, thy children, who promise today to spend life together and faithful remain until death shall part them or Christ comes again. The last verse, verse 5, reads this way. As we now witness the vows they both make, we pray for thy care on the road that they take. So grant them thy blessing, O Lord God above, and bind them together in faith, hope, and love. When Yahweh vowed to his people Israel at Mount Sinai and declared them to be his peculiar people, brothers and sisters, he meant to keep that covenant to the end. Israel didn't. But he will win. He will get them back. He will renew that marriage. And there will be a time of great rejoicing. We have been espoused to our Lord Jesus Christ. We made a vow in baptism. The marriage is about to come. And when it does, we are taken as part of his bride. This will be our destiny. I want you to come as we conclude our studies together to Psalm 15. Now you all know that Psalm 15 is the basis of Matthew 5, 6 and 7. The manifesto of the king. He draws all of the ideas of that wonderful discourse on the mount, Matthew 5, 6 and 7, from Psalm 15. Little wonder, of course. A Psalm of David. Yahweh, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Just stop there. The word abide in the Hebrew, gub, means to turn aside from the way for lodging. Temporary lodging. So it's about sojourn. It's about where we are right now, brothers and sisters. We're, we're sojourners, aren't we? We're on the way to a hill. But we're here temporarily, we're not here permanently. Who shall abide in probation, it means, in thy tabernacle, in the, in the ecclesia, the house of God, Yahweh's tabernacle, so to speak. But then there's a second question in verse 1. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The word dwell here in the Hebrew is shaken. Now, this is where the word shekinah comes from doesn't it? Shekin means to dwell. And you all know about the Shekinah glory and the glory of Yahweh that was between the cherubim. Why? Well, it was there permanently. I not didn't go anywhere. So you see, this second question is about who's going to be there permanently. Who's going to be made immortal? So there are two very important questions there. We are now abiding or sojourning in the current tabernacle. But it's not where we're going to end up. We're going to end up dwelling permanently in Yahweh's holy hill of Zion. So how do you get there? Well, this is why the King's Manifesto is based upon Psalm 15, because he, Christ tells us how you get there. But so does this psalm. So let's read on. Verse 2. Honesty. First and foremost, brothers and sisters, honesty. Integrity before God. He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbour, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbour, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoureth them that fear Yahweh. 
Now look at this one. At the end of verse 4. He that sweareth. You know what that word is in the Hebrew? Shaba. S-H-A-B-A. It means to seven oneself. It's about making covenants, brothers and sisters. He that sweareth to his own hurt. In other words, sometimes when you make a covenant, it results in hurt. It results in outcomes that you wouldn't choose for yourself. And we're about to remember a man. He might not necessarily have chosen the awful experience that he had to go through. Is there another way? There was no other way. The covenant that God had made to the fathers had to be confirmed. The first great covenant of Genesis 3.15 had to be fulfilled. In the crushing of the serpent's head, it hurt. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury or taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. And the word moved in the Hebrew means to waver or to shake. What sometimes happens in this city. He shall never be moved. Brothers and sisters, Gibeah of Saul is about making and breaking covenants. The Gibeah, the hill, the Gibeah where you and I are going, will be attained by keeping covenant. Fulfill unto Yahweh your vows. Let your yea be yea and your nay be known. If you've sworn to your own hurt, then be like this man that we're going to remember here this morning and change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, same today. He's about to come and to take his bride.